Uh, renewing students' mind, why apologetics is essential in discipleship. Why apologetics is essential in discipleship. And I'm supposed to do all that in about 20 minutes, which for a black preacher, that's just an introduction. <laughs> so uh, we are going to go through this as quickly as we can and hopefully be able to get something meaningful out of it within the time that we have. Renewing students' mind, why apologetics is essential in discipleship. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to broaden our understanding of discipleship, I mean, of um, apologetics in discipleship, because most of the time, people tend to think of apologetics as just giving an answer to, to a question somebody might have, and it stops there. But the Bible addresses this topic in a much broader way and in a way that, is, that we are very likely to miss if we don't pay attention to what the Word of God tells us, the instructions that we are given to be able to disciple His people. And I want to make this point uh, right from the beginning, that even if we were all believers in this world, if everybody tomorrow became a believer, we would still need apologetics. Because apologetics is really serving God with our minds. It is loving God with our minds. That's what apologetics is all about. And we don't stop loving God with our minds just because we are believers. And so this uh, topic of apologetics in discipleship is central, is crucial to what you are doing on university campuses. And what I'm going to do is mention just a little bit about what is going on in Africa and compare that a little bit and contrast that a little bit with what's going on here. Because as you know, the gospel, the Bible, gave us what is called Western civilization. It changed the West. And if you don't believe me, you can read this from a, 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 in an article that was entitled, As an Atheist, I Truly Believe Africa Needs God. This article was put together by a man who is from the UK, but he was born and raised in Africa, and then he went back to the UK to become a very famous preacher. I mean, a writer, he's not a preacher, he's, not, he's an atheist. A very famous writer and a member of parliament, a very respected person. But he wrote this article you, that you can find online, as an atheist, I truly believe Africa needs God. His name is Matthew Paris. And Matthew Paris said this, that what Africa needs is not more aid money, and he wasn't talking about people, the good things missionaries do, like building hospitals and schools and all that. He was talking about people actually giving their lives to Christ and becoming believers in God, in Christ. And that's what changed Europe. Very fascinating to hear that coming from an atheist. But let me ask you this. If he is right, and I believe he is, that we need people who would teach us to be able to do that back there in Africa. Why is it that we keep hearing about all things, all these things that go wrong there? In my, in my own country, for example, of Kenya, where I come from, where I was born and raised, in uh, 2008, there were some elections that were disputed, and within a very short time, we had over 1,300 people put to death, and over 600,000 displaced. They lost their homes in a country that claims to be 80% Christian with so many churches. I spoke at a, in a church where somebody get, uh, got up to give his testimony and said this. Last Sunday, my house was burned down, and the person who burned down my house was the same person who led worship in our church that same day. What is going on when so many people are giving their lives to Christ by the thousands when we don't see the change taking place? There are many reasons why that is happening. But one of the biggest reasons is we have not taught people how to love God with their minds. And so their worldviews, their way of looking at the world, their way of thinking, what they value and all that, remains unchanged even after they have given their lives to Christ. A very, very serious problem. So let me give you three reasons why we cannot ignore apologetics in our efforts to disciple people that we are working with. Reason number one, it's commanded and practice in the scriptures. Loving God with our minds is commanded and practiced in the scriptures. For example, 1 Peter 3, 15, everybody knows that verse that commands us to be prepared to give an answer to anyone who wants to know 
why we have this hope that we sang about in Christ. We are commanded to be prepared. That word answer, as you know, is a Greek word apologia from which we get the word apologetic. And that's another command given to us by First Peter. And we see in Matthew chapter 22, which is my favorite passage when we're talking about this topic, Jesus engaged in a battle for the mind with people who are trying to discredit him. They have been trying to, to uh, discredit his ministry and they have not succeeded because everybody loves him and they all believe that he is a prophet. So they come up with a way of trying to silence him by asking him questions in public that would embarrass him and so the people, the Jews can stop following him if, if he can answer this question. And you see the exchange there is quite fascinating. We don't, unfortunately, we don't have the time to go through it. So we see, we see it. Jesus doing that, and of course, Paul doing it also, for example, in Acts chapter 17. Loving God with our minds. It's commanded, and it is practiced in the scriptures, and it has been practiced throughout history in the church. And that's what gave us, for example, modern science and technology. They all came about as a result of having the biblical worldview entrenched in the minds of our brothers and sisters in the past in Europe, who are committed to God and who are able to look at the world the way God looks at it. And so they had this phrase that they used over and over again, that they were thinking God's thoughts after him when he, they practiced science and human rights and all that. And yet in our day, the type of faith that, we, that, that many of us practice and what, what we are practicing in Africa for the most part cannot really be able to replicate what others have done in the past. And that's a serious, serious mistake. It's commanded and it's practiced in the scriptures. Number two, it is a form of spiritual warfare. It is a form of spiritual warfare. And you find this, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 3 to verse 5, where Paul says, the weapons that we fight with have power to demolish strongholds. We destroy arguments. We take every thought captive. He is referring to what goes on in our minds. And that is what you are engaged in on a university campus. If in trying to serve the students, you do not equip them to be able to face the onslaught of ideas they will face on the university campus, we will be failing in our duty, because that is the most serious issue students face on the campus, because the mo most educational systems today are controlled by the philosophy of naturalism. Yeah. That, is, that is what holds them, and many of them have no idea what to do with, when we tell them about God, what God expects of them, and what their professors who have PhDs and who are very learned, and many of them really nice, not like Richard Dawkins, really nice people, like the professor that I have at uh, the University of Georgia who have been studying, uh, trying to earn a PhD. I'll be defending my prospectors next Friday, actually. The people, my professors, are all atheists. And I sit in class listening to them, some classes that I was taking, there were, there were undergraduate students there, and wondering, how in the world are these students going to process this? How can they reconcile what's being said here with their faith? It is a form of spiritual warfare, and we cannot afford to ignore it. There is, of, of course, deliverance ministry. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about ideas, and ideas being the most effective weapon that our enemy has against us. If you don't believe me or what Paul is saying here, just, just ask, ask yourself this question. How did the devil succeed in driving Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden? He did not succeed by overpowering their will, by an illness, or by anything like that. He succeeded by planting an idea in their mind. If you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. And ever since we bought into that lie, we have never given up the temptation to either lift ourselves up to God's level or bring God down to our level so that we can deal with him as equals. We are always looking for a chance to say to God, I can take it from here. It is a form of spiritual warfare, and so it applies whether or not there are non-believers that we are talking to, because it's a, it's, it's a process of being able to love God 
with our minds. Maybe you, maybe you have read uh, this story. When I first read it, I, it was very, I found it very fascinating, um, actually unbelievable, because it was a story about uh, Charles Templeton, who was a preaching partner of Billy Graham in their younger days. And actually, many people thought Charles Templeton was a much better preacher. He had a much brighter future than Billy Graham did. But he had these doubts in his mind that were tro- quite troubling to him. He ended up going to Princeton, and he lost his faith. He became an agnostic, very opposed to Christianity, and he kept writing books against God as, as an agnostic. His last book, very sadly, was entitled Farewell to God. Liz Trouble interviewed him for one of Liz Trouble's books just before, uh, before he died, before Templeton died. And during the interview, in the course of the interview, they started talking about Jesus. And as the conversation turned to Jesus, Templeton's eyes welled up with tears. And then he said, he said this, I really, really miss him. I miss Jesus. He had learned to love Jesus with his heart, but his mind told him no. And whatever your mind rejects, your life will eventually reject it as well, however close it may be to your heart. We make a serious mistake when we separate the heart from the mind. They're supposed to be able to work together in honesty as we minister to the people that we are working with. Here is Job as an apologist, truly amazing. Listen to what he says. Speaking to his friends, we're trying to comfort him. He says this, If only you'd be, you'd be altogether silent. For you, that would be wisdom. Hear now my argument. Listen to the plea of my lips. Will you speak wickedly on God's behalf? Will you speak deceitfully for him? In other words, are you going to make things up to defend God? Doesn't God care about what is true and what is right? Then he says this, Will you show him partiality? In other words, are you trying to favor God when it comes to truth? Or are you doing your homework to speak what is true before God? He goes on to say this. Would it turn out well if he examined you? Could you deceive him as you might deceive men? He would surely rebuke you if you secretly showed partiality. Would, Would not his splendor terrify you? Would not the dread of him fall on you? Your maxims or uh, proverbs of ashes, your defenses or your apologetics, your defenses are defenses of clay. That God truly cares about what is true. And he wants us to be able to take the questions that those under our care have, to take them seriously and grapple with them and be honest and we can answer them as we disciple them to grow. Answering questions, doing apologetics is not the only thing that we need to do, but it has to be one of the things that, the things that we do, especially on a university campus, because that's how the faith is being attacked um, among many of our students. It is a form of spiritual warfare, and we ignore the life of the mind at our own peril. It's a dangerous game to play. Number three, it's indispensable in the application of God's word to our life. If you want to apply God's words to your life, you're going to have to think it through. There is no other way. It is indispensable in the application of God's words to our life. And this is where I see the problem demonstrated for us in the illustration that I just gave, that I gave in the opening, where we see the gospel having done its work in the West to change the West, and we see the lack of change or impact on the cultures of Africa, where we see people who are elders in the church one day doing and unbelievable, committing unbelievable acts of evil during the week. The reason is they haven't properly understood the power of the gospel to truly change cultures. They haven't understood how that works. 
If you look at how the gospel was practiced here in the West, for example, if you don't love history, you don't like history, you can take a nap now. We'll wake you up when this party, party is for, over. <laughs> I say the gospel gave us the Western civilization. It gave us science and technology and all that. If you look at the people who spearheaded those movements, you will also find out that there were people who are very, very committed to the life of the mind. Take somebody like Jonathan Edwards, for example, who could be a local pastor as well as uh, the president of Princeton at one point. If you wanted to know the best learning, the, the best information you could get on a topic in those days, you went to the church to talk to somebody at the church. And then what happened was this. The gospel came under severe attack from mainly three fronts, from science, from philosophy, and from higher criticism that developed in Germany. And when that happened, if you trace the history of what happened in the West, you find out that what we did as believers, for the most part, is that we started, we abandoned those centers of learning, the universities, and we started the Bible school movement, and the Bible school movement that was supposed to I was supposed to focus on the souls of people, teaching people how to go to heaven when they die, and we did not know how to teach them about what to do with that faith here and now, once they have given their lives to Christ. And the kind of the gospel that was transported to Africa is the kind of the gospel that teaches people how to pray, how to be able how to go to heaven when they die, and people do a wonderful job of worship, praying, and all that, but we don't know how to connect that gospel with our lives here and now. In the West, in the West, you can live off of the momentum that was put in place by the legacy of Christendom. In these other places, we've never had that legacy at all. And what is going on right now, if you want to see what faith looks like, what Christianity looks like when it's severed from this command to disciple the mind, when you, if you want to see what it looks like, you, don't, you just need to look at what's going on in these places. And that's one of the reasons why I am moving my family back to Africa, not because I can be able to solve all the problems that are there, but I want to be able to do what I possibly can to be able... to be able to begin to face this need. Now, let me read a quote, just two quotes, and I'll be done. One from Matthew Paris, the atheist that I quoted. This is how he ended his article. Powerful, powerful word. He says this. Those who want Africa to walk tall amid 21st century global competition must not kid themselves that providing the material means or even the know-how that accompanies what we call development will make the change. A whole belief system must first be supplanted, and I'm afraid it has to be supplanted by another. Removing Christian evangelism from the African equation may leave the continent at the mercy of a malign fusion of Nike, the witch doctor, the mobile phone, and the machete. Which is exactly what we see when we don't teach people how to love God with their minds. Last quote from Martin Luther an incredible warning for all of us. Martin Luther says this, if I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exp exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at the moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle ranges, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefields besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. The point for us right now is loving God with our minds. The mind has been described as the most neglected mission field in our day. And you are right in the thick of it. And we do pray for you. And we want to support you in any way that we can. Talk to Carson, who will be here for, for, for the whole time. Thank you so much. I'll pray very briefly, and then we can have a Q&A. Father, we thank you for the fact that we know what, what you have done throughout history. 
and that you have given us all the resources that we need to be able to replicate that and even to build on what others have done and even do much, much more. I pray for everybody in this room right now that, Lord, you will continue to bless their ministers, to remember them. We have uh, struggles, wounds, and things that we haven't even talked about here but we've, that we've been praying about, and I continue to pray, Lord God, that you will minister to everybody here during these three days and that they will, be not, they will not be wasted, and, but your presence, Lord, will be with us here. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So. The momentum is waning now, but for the most part, you do have that moral outlook built into the culture. But if you don't have but if you look at some other parts of the world, for example, in where I come from, in Kenya, where you don't have that legacy, you find it very, very difficult to implement it because it's not being implemented or taught as the gospel is transmitted. And let me give you a, a, a I, I could give you lots of examples uh, on this. Um, I, I even have a hard time knowing which one to choose, but let me just pick, pick this one. I was, uh, I was working for a company in, uh, in, in California when I was in, in, uh, in grad school, and a guy who was also employed by the same company who was a Muslim left. Now, a friend of mine who is a pastor from Kenya was also working there, and there was this other um, uh, young lady, American lady, who was, not, who was not a believer at all. And I went into my friend's, the Muslim's um, locker and found a book that he had left there explaining what Islam is about. And I, I did not plan this as an experiment. And I, said, I showed it to, this, uh, to my friend. I said, oh, my, this guy left his book in his, in his desk. And then my friend said, if you don't want it, I'll take it. I've, I've always wanted to know what Islam is about. He didn't take it then. I showed the same book to this, um, to this uh, young lady who was not a believer, and she goes, Oh, no, we need to find out where he is so we can send it to him. Different ways of looking at the same, same problem. You know, you, the, the reason it was much easier for this um, uh, American girl to think this way is because within the culture there's respect for property and there's, there are things that you have been taught growing up, whether you're a believer or not, you have those assumptions. If you don't have those assumptions built into your culture, and we don't for the most part, because the gospel was not presented that way, um, we, we, then you find a person who accepts Christ is a wonderful brother, sister in Christ, but they are not going to be able to think through that, that kind of memorial situation in the same way that a person who has that teaching within the culture would think, would think through it. So the momentum is there in the culture, but like I said, it's waning, and we have to, to it's, our, it's our duty to raise it up again, and our duty to, uh, to teach it, teach that kind of thinking in these other parts of the world where so, there are so many people who are accepting the gospel today. Is that helpful? Uh, someone else have a question? Go ahead. Uh, I'm David Don from Chicago. Okay. Uh, thank you for your uh, address. Mm -hmm. You taught us what apologetics is and why it is important. Yeah. But would you tell us how we can do it? How to do it? Yeah. Um, yeah, especially on a university campus. I think the, the best way to do it, first of all, the, the, the first basic thing that, that, that you must do is to make it safe for students to ask their questions, to raise their doubts. Tell them it is okay to do that. The reason we don't do it most of the time is because we may not have the answer, we'll look bad. Don't worry about looking bad. I have no problem, I've been doing this for quite a while now, but I have no problem telling somebody, I don't know the answer to your question. Let me work on it and I'll come back and we can look at this together. So it's making the place safe for students to ask questions. And that's why open forums, the open forums that we do are so popular because people know when they come there, they'll be allowed to ask questions. And then, Get together with, uh, with organizations on campus. I don't know what goes on if you, if you guys work together or you fight each other as campus <laughs> ministries. Um, with organizations, apologetic organizations, that can be able to help through this process. Or get somebody on your team who can be able to do or is willing 
to do the homework for, 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 for other people who has the time to do it. So the first thing to do is to make it safe for, for people to ask questions, to raise their doubts, their struggles. And, and what we tend to do in our churches for the most part is, if you find somebody who is questioning too much, we tend to push them away. That's a serious, serious mistake. We don't see Jesus doing that. We see him answering questions. Even when the people who are asking the questions are asking those questions out of really bad motives. He still answers the questions. Read Matthew chapter 22, and you see that that's actually the case. So make it safe for students to ask the question. Get together with, or look for somebody who can be able to devote their time to, to doing the homework. And then, uh, and then uh, the other thing you could do is uh, invite us. We would love to come and do what we can do. Yeah. But, but to introduce them to apologetics, I'll give them William N. Craig's On Guard, on Guard by William Lane Craig, and um, maybe least troubles the case for Christ. I would begin there. The case for Christ by least trouble. The, on on Guard on Guard by William Lane. G. Uh, this is Ken, Kenyan pronunciation. On Guard. G U A R D. On Guard by William Lane Craig. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing with us. We love Kenya. We've been there a few times, and so okay. it's good to, to, uh, to, to be here with you. My question is, my wife and I work primarily with um, African-American students and um, on historically black colleges, and I was talking with uh, a friend of mine, and uh, one of the things he was addressing in apologetics is there's many resources uh, out there that address, uh, address a lot of issues. But when you start talking about, like, um, the issues that African Americans will face, particularly in black communities with uh, five, percent, five percenters and a nation, the black nation of Islam and kind of the African religion and different things like that, there's not a lot out there on, mm -hmm. on responding to that. So is there any... Uh, direction you could point us in with that. Um, there's a there's a uh, one of the one a book that Ravi edited. I think it's called Who Made God. Um, there's a there's a chapter on those those uh, those, those movements in that book. And um, if you write to me, I can connect you with the, with the person who wrote that chapter. Yeah, I'll be I'll be glad to do that. Yeah, if I don't if you don't if you don't get my email address for me. You can get it from Carson. Could I just throw a couple books in real quick? There's University Press released a book called Defending Black Faith. Okay. And that would really help on that, if All that's right. helpful. I'm Leah Kelly, and we work with um, Korean students okay. at the University of Tennessee. Yeah. And as you're talking, I'm wondering, um, as a Westerner, mm -hmm. do we need to repent for what gospel we took to these nations and that feels I feel um, conviction uh, and sadness yeah I'm I'm really glad you asked that question because uh, it gives me the chance to say that um, if you if you walk out of here based on feeling guilty based on what, what, what I said, I would have failed in what I was trying to do. Because uh, guilt is never a good motivator for anything. If you are motivated by guilt, your willingness to act lasts only for as long as those feelings are there. When they are gone, you go right back where you were before. So we need to be motivated by the right thing, by the great commandment, which is love for people. No, that, that's number one. Number two... I am also extremely hesitant to criticize missionaries, people who brought the gospel there, because I have worked very closely with a lot of them. I grew up under very, very difficult circumstances. There were times when uh, my, my family, my mom had to take care of eight kids by herself without a home. We were homeless for a while. And it, it, it's just by God's grace that, I, that I'm still alive, even, even today. And it was through the missionaries who sacrificed so much and brought to Africa the gospel, the best they understood it. So if we were, if um, I am actually, I'm actually, 
ashamed in their presence. I wouldn't, so the goal is not to criticize them. It is to look at what we have been doing and what has, hasn't gone well and correct it. That's, 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 that's the motivation. That's what we, that's what we need to do. So, so uh, it's not that we need, we need to, re, um, to repent. It is that we need to say, we need to see, this is, uh, this is something we have neglected. Let's just get it done. Yeah, let's, let's do this. And not worry about being guilty or who, who is to blame and all that. Let's worry about what, what needs to be done. Yeah, what we can do. It's a question I hear all the time in Africa. Are you not usurping the power of the Spirit if you talk about loving God with your minds, doing research and all these things? How, do, how do, does that all work together? And the answer I give to that is, I normally will take the person who asked the question back to the scriptures, and I will go, for example, through Matthew 22 or First Peter um, 3 and all that, and I will show them the fact that we are commanded to do it, we see the disciples do it, it's Jesus doing it. So what I normally do, and it, it has worked with a lot of them, is I will ask them, I will, I will place the person on my team, and I will say, this is, this is what I see in the scriptures, or how would you answer a person who understands these, these verses this way, or how would you explain them? And most of the time, what I want the, the other time when I want the person to do is to argue with the scriptures, not to argue with me. Because if it's not there, if it's not in the scriptures, then I want to know it because I don't want to waste time, time doing it. But if it's there, as we, as, uh, we have been trying to argue, then we need, we, need, uh, we, we need to pay attention to it. But how do they work together? I would say that the spirit is the foundation of all that we are doing. We can be able to, it doesn't follow that if you are uh, using your mind, you are, you are very, very good at logic and all that, you end up becoming a Christian. I know people, my logic professors are not, not, not Christian. They actually oppose, oppose Christianity. So the, um, the, uh, the fact that you are studying and using your mind and all that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to find God that way. What we are supposed to be doing is to... Uh, is, is to commit our lives to God and to deal with the presuppositions and issues that keep us from knowing God as he desires to be known. The Bible places a significant emphasis on the will, the transformation of, of the will, and what we want to be the case. Because many times, what we want to be the case can keep us from accepting what is actually the case. So submission to the Holy Spirit is primary in everything that we do. Because apologetics has a bad name in many circles today and for good reason because it, it tends to attract people who like to argue with others. And you just argue and argue and argue and get nowhere. I'm glad we don't follow that strategy at because I'm not, I'm not very good at that. I, 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 don't, I, don't, um, I don't do very well when it's just argument after argument and all that. And so that, that is not, if we, if we understand it that way, then the objection is valid. But if we understand it as dependence upon the Holy Spirit and then the use of our mind to understand the scriptures as well as we can and to be able to learn how to love God with our mind and to appreciate what he has made and what, what the mind that he has given us in such a way that we can be able to guide somebody else, that is not opposed at all to the work of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. In fact, we cannot do that well, work and do it well without dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I see the, 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 uh, by the time I'm presenting this, I am assuming that we already agree that there's nothing we can accomplish as believers outside of the power of the Holy Spirit. So that, that is foundational.